So good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be at ICTS, and I thank the organizers uh, for the invitation, which has given me yet another opportunity to be here. So uh, today I'll tell you a story about uh, Polymer that is going on this very interesting voyage through a turbulent flow. And uh, you'll see that it stretches, recoils, sometimes breaks, which can be uh, fortunate or unfortunate uh, for us. Uh, so this is a typical cartoon of uh, what really happens in turbulence. And this is what will separate turbulence or the way a polymer behaves in turbulence from the way it behaves in a laminar flow, even a shear flow, where it is, of course, flipping and rotating. Uh, but here, the chaotic nature of things makes uh, stuff more interesting. Oh, so this is the end-to-end uh, -end extension of the polymer uh, from simulation data. So it, uh, it, this is about 100 times its equilibrium uh, coil uh, extension. And then it kind of, when it goes into some region of the flow, which is quiescent, it recoils and so on. And it could be oh, no, sorry. So this uh, line is uh, just an arbitrary threshold of about halfway. Yeah. So uh, one of the joys of working on this problem was uh, to collaborate with Dario, who's at Nice. So he, most of the work I've done as uh, he's my principal collaborator, uh, but also Emmanuel who's at Vietnam, Shamridi here at ICTS, Takeshi in Japan. Okay, so the uh, overall motivation to study these things comes from the way polymers imp impact uh, flows at the large scales. So if you look at slow flows or low Reynolds number flows, which are uh, which would be in the Stokes regime. We see that polymers have an impact there. So uh, uh, one of the many experiments that Steinberg has looked at is this kind of serpentine microchannel. So you have uh, two inlets, you send in the same fluid, but one of them is dyed. And then you allow it to go through this uh, serpentine thing and look at it about 29 turns later. And you see that they're pretty much uh, unmixed because it's just diffusion. So it's very slow diffusive mixing. This is with a pure solvent like water. And then if you put in uh, a polymer solution and dye one half, you see that after the same number of turns, things are really homogenized and mixed very well. In fact, uh, if you're familiar with chaotic mixing, it really looks like that. There are these kinds of striation patterns that are a result of stretching and folding of the fluid elements. And uh, what's important to note is the small Reynolds number. Right? So uh, there is no chance of turbulence uh, in this small. Uh, at these small length scales. And it's really the polymer and the feedback of the polymer on the flow that is uh, causing these effects. What is W sub i? Oh, that's the uh, Weisenberg number. So it's uh, the relaxation time scale of the polymer to some time scale in the flow. Uh, here it would be uh, the inverse shear rate, let's say, in the fluid. So if the Weisenberg, if this Weisenberg is high, it means the polymers can get stretched and start interacting with the flow. So another kind of experiment is this kind of coate cell. So you have two rotating plates. And uh, again, a pure solvent will just give you something approximating a coate flow or a linear uh, shear. But uh, when you put in polymers, you get, again, a chaotic kind of regime. So this has been called elastic turbulence. And there are several experiments that show this behavior. So this has applications for enhancing mixing, let's say, in microfluidics. Now, th that was a situation where the fluid, the Newtonian fluid, was just going to show some simple laminar behavior, and the polymer excites some interesting dynamics. Uh, something, in some sense, uh, the opposite thing happens if you start out with a fluid that is turbulent. So you take a Newtonian fluid, and it is turbulent, like a turbulent channel flow. And now if you add polymer, you actually see uh, in some sense, a suppression of the turbulent fluctuations. So a typical uh, application, which has been of interest for a while, is if you look at uh, flow in a pipe, right? When things are laminar, you get the hagen poiseuille solution, which is this blue line, right? So that's the usual parabolic flow. Uh, if you think of a given pressure drop, and now the flow goes turbulent, right? Then uh, you have a lower volumetric flow rate, and the velocity profile gets blunted. So the fact that in this cartoon, the peak velocity has dropped is another way of saying that you have enhanced drag. Right? So the pressure, the pressure drop you need to apply to transport a certain amount of fluid at a certain flow rate goes up if you become turbulent relative to the laminar flow. But now if you put in polymer, so that's the blue to the black line, but if you put in polymers 
you see there is some enhancement in the uh, flow rate. So you actually reduce the drag. So this is polymer induced drag reduction and which has been known now for decades. So people have done simulations, have been doing it for a while, and this is a relatively recent one, 2019. Uh, so this is a channel flow, and they are visualizing the vorticity near the ball. Uh, without going into details, what I just want to point out is this is a turbulent uh, channel flow uh, near the boundary layer at the wall when it's Newtonian. And as you add polymer and increase the Weisenberg number, again, so the polymers are getting stretched. In this zoomed-in box, which is expanded here, you see that the vortices have this horseshoe structure in a typical Newtonian turbulent flow. And those vortex structures break down and you know, become uh, quite different and actually sim simpler in their topology. And the uh, fl fluctuation intensity also drops. So that this uh, loss of drag right, or the drag reduction can be seen in all kinds of uh, manifestations in the properties of the turbulent flow. So this is again just to show that even when the flow is turbulent, polymers can have a dramatic effect on the flow. And the way this happens is that individual polymers, essentially the fluid stretches out the polymer. Right? So the, I'm talking only about linear polymers now. So it's like a long chain. Uh, without the flow, they are all coiled up entropically. And then when the fluid exerts a, a drag on different parts of the polymer, it can stretch out the polymer. And then if it goes into some region of the flow, which is quiescent, the polymer shrinks back exerts a feedback force on the fluid. And this gives you a kind of polymeric stress that changes the nature of the flow. Sorry, what is Q? Um, sorry, I don't recall. Not sure. No, no, I don't think so, no. Right, probably. So, uh, what Prasad is pointing out is that this Q is a kind of, uh, it's an invariant of the velocity gradient tensor. So, if it's positive, it indicates rotationality. And they have set some threshold value to visualize these contours, I guess. And it's probably changing uh, because as you add polymer, the fluctuations in the velocity gradient reduce. So, the mean reduces. So, they have to reduce this threshold value to keep up with that change. Okay, so in these things, these are all continuum simulations. So what they do is they solve the Navier-Stokes, but with a divergence of an, so this is the viscous stress, right? There's an extra divergence of an extra stress tensor, which comes from the polymer. And uh, one way of looking at it is that there is this conformation tensor, which represents the ensemble average of this extension vector. So if it is, uh, if all the polymers are shrunk, this is just like the identity. So then this will just give you another pressure-like contribution. But when the polymers start to stretch out, this tensor becomes anisotropic, it has, and it evolves according to its own partial differential equation. So uh, I won't go into details here, but the point is, in these simulations, you are really just solving field equations. It's a continuum theory. And just with this, you can get reasonably good qualitative predictions. So you are able to show elastic turbulence, as in the previous case, right? And you can also reproduce uh, this drag reduction behavior at high Reynolds numbers. And a lot of the theory in viscoelastic fluids uses some kind of continuum equation like this. Okay, but the story I want to tell you about today is when these models don't work. And uh, essentially they fail or we need to do something special when you want to capture molecular scale effects about the polymer. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So this is a very nice uh, uh, paper in PRL in 2002. So what they did is they took DNA in a buffer solution and put it in a micro channel, similar to what I showed you earlier, and they measured the pressure drop. Right? So the solvent by itself shows a certain pressure drop. You add the DNA and make it flow through, the pressure drop decreases. So you have drag reduction. And they see that quite nicely with this, uh, in this case. So they are plotting the percentage reduction in this drag. Right? So you get about 6% drag reduction with, the, with DNA. And this is now the double stranded DNA in a buffer solution. What they then did is took the DNA and put it in water so that it denatures and becomes single strand. So everything else about the polymer in some sense is the same, but you just split up the strands. And when they then did the experiment, they lost drag reduction significantly. So that is this stuff in distal water. So the amount of drag reduction is much less 
And in fact, it decays in time, uh, whereas it doesn't in the first case. So what actually happens is the polymers start breaking up. So what I found interesting here is, in terms of the continuum model, the continuum model just has a parameter for the relaxation time of the polymer. It has no other, I mean, there's no place to put any more information. Right? But here, all things about the polymer are similar, except you have split them up. So definitely some mechanical properties have changed. Its ability to bend or fold and so on have changed. But can we incorporate all of that in just one time scale? Uh, seems unlikely. Uh, and then also there is the fact that in time, the drag is reducing. This is because the polymer is breaking up. And that brings me to my second uh, example, which is exactly mechanical scission. So for a long time, people have known that this breakup thing is an issue. In fact, in uh, applications of drag reduction, where you put in polymers to reduce the drag, with time that you lose the benefits because the polymer degrades. So this is an early experiment in 93, which shows this nicely. So what's plotted here is a friction factor, which is some non-dimensionalized uh, pressure drop versus the Reynolds number. And they have got two different polymers uh, in two different solvents. Uh, oh, sorry, the same polymer and two solvents. So what they see is that this is the Newtonian uh, friction factor. And uh, when you put in the polymer, there's a decrease. So that's the drag reduction. But as you do this for higher Reynolds numbers, beyond a certain Reynolds number, you start losing the drag reduction and you start going towards the Newtonian limit again. So this is happening because at higher Reynolds, the flow is more strong and it starts to break apart the polymer. Okay. So you, it's the same story that you saw on the previous slide, where in time the polymer is degrading. Here they probably have a pipe, a fixed pipe. So the polymer stays in the pipe for some time and comes out. So now you can see the breakage only if you keep increasing the Reynolds number of this fixed length pipe. Okay. Uh, this is uh, another sort of experiment similar to the Kuwait kind of cell, where again they are measuring the torque in this uh, angular velocity versus torque relationship and getting a drag. And they see that the drag reduction increases in time initially as polymers stretch out and start to feed back on the flow. But then at long times, note the log scale, right? at very, very long times, you start seeing that you lose this drag reduction effect, again, because the polymers are breaking. Okay, so all of this is to say that uh, when you have these kind of molecular scale effects, either that you've changed the structure of the polymer in some way, or that something that an event that happens at the molecular scale, which is this breaking of uh, bonds, like the carbon-carbon bonds, then you can't capture this easily in a continuum framework. There have been attempts in this direction. So the group of Suarez has been among the first groups to push and try to model these things. So they have a kind of heuristic continuum model. So if you look at the black curve, it's supposed to be the drag reduction with time. So they do see a decrease, uh, but then there are all kinds of crazy things happening because uh, there are numerical instabilities and so on, which are coming out essentially because the continuum model has some ad hoc term to account for breakage. And what we need is to approach it from a first principles uh, Okay, so uh, all of this is just to motivate the fact that there is, uh, while the continuum framework has been powerful and continues to uh, remain so, uh, we also need to start looking at polymers at individually, right? And uh, understand what's happening and be able to incorporate the effects that I've just mentioned. So of course, these things have been done for a long time in the polymer physics and rheology communities where they model polymers, but in considerable detail. But they have been typically done in uh, simple viscometric flows like this sort of extensional flow or a shear flow. And what we would like to do is uh, borrow tools and techniques of Brown, for example, Brownian dynamic simulations, and then do that uh, in a turbulent DNS or in turbulent channel flows. And to be, of course, this is in itself computationally intensive, the Brownian dynamic stuff, and turbulence has its own challenges. So to try to brew it by brute force would be extremely uh, expensive. So we need ways to simplify these models and uh, you know, put them in turbulence. Maybe also try to simplify the turbulent flow. So that's what uh, I'll talk about a bit more today. Okay, so let me say a little bit about uh, how we can represent a polymer at the individual polymer scale. So uh, we are only talking about mechanical models, right? So if you start at the relatively, it's still a coarse grain model, right? Because so you have all these atoms and so on, and you kind of chunk pieces of it into beads. And then you say these beads are touching each other. So this is a kind of touching bead model for a long chain polymer. 
Okay, and what's happening at the beads is at every bead you have a Brownian force which represents the action of all the surrounding solvent molecules. And if there is a macro scale flow that exerts a Stokes in drag on these beads. So this is kind of a basic coarse grain model for the polymer. So you can call this a touching bead model. So when you do this and do it in a Quaison fluid, what you will see is that there is some uh, ordering over a certain length scale. So the polymer will kind of remain coherent in this cartoon. You can see it. And then it sort of decorrelates, right? So this kind of segment is called a Kuhn step. So one way to simplify this, because you would have to do like thousands of these beats, which becomes very intense. So one way to simplify it is, okay, the portion that's sort of coherent, let me put a rod. So that gives you this kind of uh, slender body model. So you have like sticks joined together at hinges. And along the stick, you can look at the fluid drag using slender body theory. You can simplify that even more and say, okay, I'm just going to localize all the action of the fluid drag only at certain points. That will give you this bead rod model. So you have beads which experience Brownian forces and fluid drag, and they are just connected by connectors. These are like uh, rigid rods. Uh, they don't really see the fluid. The fluid doesn't see them. Uh, this is a and even, but this is still too expensive to try to do anything in turbulence. So an even simpler thing would be to do the bead spring. So that means so what happens and essentially is you have many of these guys, still hundreds of them. So if you leave them by themselves, the Brownian forces will cause it to kind of shrink just because of to maximize entropy. So that shrinkage you can represent with a spring. So you end up with just very few beads connected by these springs, which uh, mimic the, the nature of the polymer to kind of coil. So we'll be focusing only on the last one. And that brings us to this bead spring uh, chain, which is a classic model in the Rouse model in polymer physics. So what you have is a bunch of beads and they're connected by these uh, entropic springs. And you can write down, uh, I mean, just Newton's laws for them. So you have the center of mass motion, right, which is uh, uh, the velocity at the center of mass of the macroscopic flow and the sum of all the Brownian forces. So the zeta is the Brownian force. And then you can write the equations for the separation vectors between neighboring springs. So these are just the spring forces. So every bead has two neighboring springs, right? So that affects it here. These are the difference of Brownian forces. And the most important thing in terms of the flow is this stuff, which represents the velocity difference. So if there's a bead and there are two beads and they have two different velocities, the velocity difference will cause them to stretch or shrink. Uh, so at small scales, you can do a Taylor series first order and you will get the gradient of the velocity. So that's the gradient of the velocity that the polymer experiences, which won't tries to stretch it or shrink it. Uh, these FIs, okay, so the spring is like a linear spring. Uh, so if there's a distance vector Q, the spring force is minus Q. But then you have this pre-factor F which, with which you can impose a maximum extension. So you call that a finitely extensible nonlinear elastic Feeney spring. Uh, and this is very simple still because we've ignored things like hydrodynamic interactions between the beads, extruded volume effects, and so on. I'll come back to that later if we have time. Okay, so now I, uh, I mean, I've waited probably too late to introduce the Weisenberg number, but here it is. So essentially in all these springs, you have a spring constant. So the ratio of that to the dra uh, Stokes drag coefficient, et cetera, will give you a time scale. That's a time scale with which if you release the spring, the time it takes to kind of shrink back to zero, right? So that spring time scale uh, is tau, that's there for every spring. And then if you make a bunch of them, let's say uh, 10 springs together in a chain, the whole chain will have a certain time scale. So that's what is tau chain, right? That's what's most relevant to us. And uh, that relative to the some time scale in the flow. So if it's a pipe flow, it would be the inverse shear rate. In turbulent flow, it's more complicated. I'll come to that. But uh, if you have a time scale in the flow, which represents uh, the time scale with of stretching in the fluid, then you can have this ratio and that's the Weisenberg number. So if the Weisenberg number is small, the polymer doesn't stretch and just acts like a, a passive particle. Uh, but if it's large enough, then you'd start to stretch and it can feed back. Okay, so this is for the chain, but the simplest version, again, is to just take the dumbbell, right? So the simplest thing you can you do to represent a polymer is to just have two beads and one spring. And the continuum model I showed you at the beginning is really based on this, or you can connect it to the dynamics of just a dumbbell. So most of the work that 
has been done to understand drag reduction, elastic turbulence is really representing the polymer in some ensemble average sense, just as a dumbbell. Right? So, of course, with a dumbbell, we can't capture a lot of interesting, important physics when it comes to applications, which is why we want to do these things. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that's the model. So, let me show you uh, what we can do with the model and how you can predict stretching and so on. So, I'll start with what has been done uh, in simple flows. So, if you look at this linear extensional flow, there have been experiments uh, which you can actually visualize the individual polymer molecules. And uh, in this nice science paper, they show how it's, if you, in the extensional flow, it will orient with the extension and stretch out in different ways. And you can even get the probability distribution of the end to end extension. So at small Weisenberg, everything is coiled up. And then as you increase the Weisenberg, almost all polymers stretch. If you look at the PDF here, right? just the top line. And uh, yeah, so and that's been uh, reproduced by uh, simulations using even a dumbbell. You can do it with a chain, but this basic thing is uh, easily reproduced. So you start at small Weisenberg, you're all coiled, and then at high Weisenberg, you completely stretch out. And this is called the coil stretch transition. So it happens as the Weisenberg crosses some order one number. So you go from everything being so it's called a transition because almost everything is coiled, and then suddenly everything gets fully stretched. This is all happening in this extensional flow. And the Weisenberg number in this case is defined as the relaxation time of the polymer tau divided by one upon gamma, where gamma is the extension rate in the extensional flow, the strain rate. Okay, so now let's come to turbulence. So in that extensional flow case, it's kind of obvious that it will stretch, right? You have a, the flow is trying to stretch out this molecule. You put it inside, you keep increasing the strength of the flow. It has nothing, it has to stretch out. So at some point it just fully stretches. But in turbulence, this is less obvious. So this is the visualization of the strain rate uh, magnitude in the turbulent flow, which is actually related to the dissipation rate also. So it's just a box in that I've plotted contours of the strain rate magnitude. Uh, the blue guys are, I think, uh, six times the mean and the yellow guys are four times the mean. So you can see it's very intermittent and patchy. So if you imagine that there is a polymer molecule that's going around in the flow and on the voyage, right? So when it hits one of these regions, it will get a huge spike in its stretching. And then again, it kind of goes into a Khoisan region. So in fact, if you follow a tracer or a polymer molecule through the flow, you will see a very chaotic time series of the extension rate. So epsilon is the dissipation rate, which is also related to the strain rate. So that quantity fluctuates like crazy, as you can see. here. So, and it's chaotic. So if you think about that, the very basic question is, would a polymer stretch? And how do we think of it stretching now? Because in the earlier case, it would just stretch and stay stretched. Here, it might stretch, but it might coil again and so on. So you need to think of it in the mean sense. So a basic question is, on the average, would the polymer start to stretch out in a turbulent flow, even though it is not being persistently strained? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the force in non-stress equation is not the way the polymers come in. Yes, yes. And so it as an additional stress. Okay. All right. So there's a, a contribution to the stress tensor yes. from the polymers. Yes. And do they get aligned in the flow? Like uh, They do. They have yes. some properties of pneumatics, perhaps? Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes. So you, uh, at the basic level, you can think of it as a rod that is stretchable, but with entropy wanting to make it isotropic. Okay. And then finally, um, can you also redo the experiments with uh, healable polymers? So if I had um, uh, my cell, worm-like micelles uh, that could break and yes. then heal, then maybe you could uh, compensate for the breaking. Yes, that, that would be interesting. Yes. So I think yeah, people have been doing these things. Uh, All right, sure. thanks. Okay, so uh, Lumley was the first to suggest uh, that it should happen. Polymers should stretch in the mean. Of course, we knew it uh, phenomenologically because of drag reduction. The fact that you are getting drag reduction, the polymers must be persistently stretching. But to think of it more precisely, uh, a nice way to think about it is to ask the question whether line elements stretch in a turbulent flow. So if I take, uh, if I take two tracers and I look at their distance, starting close to each other, would we expect these things to stretch out if we wait for long times? And from this perspective, the answer is yes, because we know that Turbulent flows are chaotic, right? 
So if you look at exactly the Lie element stretching, the answer to this question is what is the Lyapunov exponent of the flow? And we know that's positive. Right? So in this sense, you can already kind of anticipate that a polymer, of course, the polymer now has the spring trying to counteract this effect. But if you make the flow strong enough, the Lyapunov exponent is positive enough, it should stretch out. And so there is actually a full theory from this dynamical systems or equivalently from the large deviations perspective. Right? And uh, this is one of the seminal papers. So I'll move a little quickly because I'm running out of time. But essentially what they show is that uh, if you have the turbulent flow and you can get not only the Yapunov exponent, but the generalized Yapunov exponents. So there is a spectrum of these exponents. If you look at the ratio of, yeah. if you look at the ratio of the uh, line element, uh, how it stretches in time and you raise it to a power Q, you will get the Qth exponent. So if you have this information of the flow, then you can predict, or what they predict is that the PDF of the extension vectors of the extension R will behave like a power law. And the exponent of the power law can be related to the Weisenberg number of the polymer and the spectrum of Lyapunov exponents in the flow. Uh, so, okay, so what's important here to notice if you look at the definition of L of Q, when Q is zero, this is zero, right? So this just becomes uh, zero and L of Q is zero from the definition of the exponent. So this quantity is zero when Q is zero. That means uh, when Q is zero, alpha is going to be zero. And that would translate to a power law with a minus one power, which is not normalizable. So if I try to find the mean extension in the flow, if it's R to the minus one and I try to get the mean, it won't be defined, right? So this R to the minus one kind of PDF is what people have used to define a coil stretch in turbulence. So in the lamina case, it, you can just see everything is coil, everything fully stretches. But in turbulence, you will always have some places in the flow where polymers are shrunk because of the nature of turbulence. So we can only think of it statistically. And the statistical kind of coil stretch is when the PDF goes beyond minus one. This is, of course, I mean, a choice, right? But uh, there's some appeal to it in this sense. Coil stretch happens at alpha zero. Right? At alpha zero, right. Oh, sorry. That's my bad. Yeah, at alpha zero. Yeah, at alpha zero. So, uh, because, uh, good, th thanks for that answer. So, because of that, now you can see that because the coil stretch happens at L of Q equal to zero, I can get some useful prediction by Taylor expanding this L of Q about zero. So, if you do that and you use some other properties to establish this, uh, lambda is just the first Lyapunov exponent. So, at least near the coil stretch transition, with just knowledge of the first Lyapunov exponent of the turbulent flow, I can write out this entire spectrum. And I get this prediction. So this is a simple prediction that should work when the Weisenberg is near the coil stretch. And from this, you will get that alpha is zero when the Weisenberg critical value is half. So the prediction of this theory is that if you take that, so you take a polymer, you stretch it in a Quaisen fluid and leave it, and you look at how it relaxes. And if you look at the ensemble average relaxation time, you can get tau, tau of the polymer. You normalize that with the Lyapunov exponent of the flow now, lambda. So th this also tells you that the best time scale for the flow is one upon the Lyapunov exponent. So if you define your Weisenberg in that way as lambda times tau, then the value of half should mar mark the coil stretch. So let's see how that works out. So if I do simulations of just dumbbells, so bead two beads connected by a spring, I solve the Brownian dynamics equations, but in a DNS of turbulent flow in a periodic cube. And then I get these results. Okay, so I'm plotting the PDF of the extension from the simulations. And I've defined my Weisenberg in the way that I showed you earlier. So you can see that for small Weisenberg, you have a peak at uh, this R is normalized with the equilibrium extension. So almost everything is peaked at the equilibrium. It's all coil. And as you increase the Weisenberg, you see that near 0.5, it really stretches up. And then you get a peak on the other side at the max extension. These are Fini dumbbells. So I've, there's a maximum extension of 100 times the equilibrium, roughly. So you do have a similar coil stretch transition in turbulence. The difference, of course, is that these PDFs are all power laws, right? So they're really broad. Whereas in the, I'll come back to that later. In the lamina flow, they're much more peaked. OK, so uh, people have done many such uh, simulations of dumbbells. I, what I showed you was in a kind of toy for uh, turbulent studies, right? just a periodic cube. But people have done dumbbells in channel flows, in shear flows, uh, and so on. And I found the same basic behavior, that you have these power laws that 
flipped from being negative to positive as you cross a transition Weizenberg. Is there experimental evidence for this? So I had shown you experiments for the simple extensional flow. In turbulence, it's much harder to actually see individual polymers in a turbulent flow, which is chaotic. But Steinberg, again, has done, uh, has done this, but in the elastic turbulent regime. So at the low Stokes regime where the system is small, he puts in polymers, lets the flow reach the elastic turbulence regime. That means the flow is chaotic. Right? And then he can he visualizes the what's happening to the polymer. So he gets these kinds of things. So you can see them stretching and sort of coiling. And he looks at the PDF and he does get these power laws reasonably well. So there is experimental direct evidence for individual polymer stretching in a chaotic flow. This is not high RE turbulence, but in principle, the theory I showed you just worries about whether the flow is chaotic or not. This was the point I was making about the relative comparison. Right? So now this is coil stretch in turbulence, and this is the same thing in laminar flow. And the main difference is how broad the PDFs are. So in turbulence, even after, even at pretty high Weizenberg of four, there's still a broad distribution. Whereas in laminar flows, I mean, it's really just a very narrow peak. It just completely shifts. And that sort of makes sense, right? Here, the polymers just align with the stretching direction and everything stretches out. But in turbulence, there's vorticity. It keeps re-rotating. The strain rate itself is fluctuating. So things are much broader. Okay, so yes. Relaxed stretching of the polymers, right? This R in X axis. It's the end to end extension of the polymer. So if I have some polymer like this, I, it's the end to end distance. So this suggests that that, um, that end to end length changes, like. Yeah, it's stretching, right. So it stretches and stays there. Yeah. Like it is the new relaxed I mean, stress. I yeah, say. so this is just the PDF, right? So there are, let's say, thousands of these yeah, polymers. I'm to, yeah, just, if right. it is a narrow peak and a yeah, high correct. R, so yeah. that, that's. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay. And the same thing there, except now there's a much broader distribution broader, of yeah. extent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, all of this was to show that there is uh, there are uh, nice models for polymers. Is a hierarchy of them. Yes. So in all these cases, uh, still uh, the Reynolds number is uh, less than the Weizenberg number. No, so the Reynolds number is high enough for the flow to be turbulent. This is a fully turbulent uh, flow. Yeah. So 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 is the undergoing mechanism is driven by inertia or are they elasto inertial or something? So from the polymer perspective. What's important is that the background flow is turbulent. It doesn't matter whether it is high RE turbulence or elastic turbulence. I'm just in this narrow, for this narrow thing. So the polymer is experiencing a fluctuating strain rate. If the Lapinov exponent of that background flow is positive, then it will stretch out. So in either case, this would work. But this particular data is from a high RE turbulent flow in a box. Okay, so uh, we can see that there is a hierarchy of polymer models that right, all the way from uh, bead, small beads to bead rods and dumbbells, right? So these are just dumbbells. So you can think about coarse graining it and so on. And people have been doing that in polymer groups. But hopefully what I've convinced you here is that the nature of the flow that the polymer experiences in uh, extensional flow or even a, a shear flow, et cetera, is quite different from what it would experience in turbulence, where things are stretching, fluctuating, and so on. So probably the coarse graining schemes, which have some amount of empiricism in it, which work in simple viscometric flows, need not work in turbulence. So if I want to model quantitatively turbulent drag reduction with just a dumbbell, I need to figure out how that complex chain works in a turbulent flow and then get a dumbbell model. Right? So that's what I wanted to try to point out here. So then that means I need to go look at more complex polymer models, put it in turbulence. But that is intensive because not only is the model difficult to simulate, just the polymer model, turbulence itself is complex, right? So that brings me to the question of, since it's intensive, can I simplify the flow feed? So I know I can approximate the polymer model all the way from uh, many, many beads to uh, just a dumbbell. Can I do something for the turbulent flow or am I just left with having to run DNS of turbulence? So uh, yeah, so this is where things are nice. So you can actually, 
because the main feature of turbulence that we want to capture is the fact that it is stochastic and fluctuating. So could I replace this turbulent flow with a, just a random flow field? Right? And this is what we are going to do now. So the only way that turbulent flow impacts the polymer is by its, by its velocity gradient. Right? This is the term in the polymer model that causes the stretching. So can I replace, so this is some chaotic time series, right? the velocity gradient so matrix. Can I replace this with just a random uh, field, kappa of t? So it's some matrix whose entries are random numbers and whose properties I choose in some way to mimic the turbulent. So if I do this, can I reproduce some of the properties of polymers that we are interested in? So one good choice or one uh, popular choice for kappa, which has been used often is the bachelor Crichton velocity gradient. So it is a second order tensor. It's chosen such that it is isotropic because it, in this case, at least I'm trying to reproduce that box turbulence, which is homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So I choose an isotropic tensor for, for the simplicity, simplicity right now, I'm taking it to be delta correlated in time. Right? So then we can do uh, some theory with that. And then the second order correlations are chosen in such a way that you are incompressible. So even if you don't want to worry about this, it's basically some matrix where you have to toss random numbers to fill the entries, but in certain ways so that you maintain incompressibility and isotropic. So if I do that, because the flow is delta correlated, right? I can write down the, uh, uh, I mean, I can write down a stochastic differential equation or the, just the dumbbell where R is the extension vector. Right, and now instead of grad V, I have this uh, random tensor kappa of t. And you'll see that this is now a noise. There's of course, this zeta is a Brownian force. So this is the usual additive noise, but this kappa is multiplying R. So it's actually multiplicated and has to be interpreted in the Stratonovich sense. So that is important for what we're going to show. Okay, so any questions about this uh, SD, where it comes from? So it's R is now just a vector, right? It, uh, its dynamics depend on random stretching because of this kappa. It's sinking because of the Feeney spring. And then there's, of course, Brownian forces. Yes. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here it, this would be for the QI is the ith extension in a chain and the end to end is R. So when I just take a dumbbell, Q and R are same. Okay, so now what is my goal here? I want to try to predict the PDF of R, right? So since now I have a nice SD, I can try to look at the Fokker Planck equation for the PDF, right? And this is a standard form. So I can use the usual uh, theory of stochastic differential equation and uh, write down the Fokker Planck equation, right? So that's just a diffusion equation. So this P is now the PDF of R and uh, it looks like a diffusion equation. This D1 is the advective term, D2 is the diffusive term, right? And both of them, interestingly, both depend on the Weisenberg number. So it's, uh, I mean, what's important is normally you think of that D2, the diffusion in the Fokker Planck equation just comes from Brownian motion. So that part is there here, but because it is Stratonovich noise, it also has another contribution and vice versa. So that is important, but if you don't interpret that term in the Stratonovich sense, you won't get the correct. Okay. So now this is the, I mean, this is a PD. I can, I can solve this diffusion equation and I can get the PDF, but instead of doing a numerical simulation, what we are after is the power law exponent. So if I look at R lying between, if I say that I have a large enough scale separation between the equilibrium and max extension, then I can look for a power law. So if I put that ansatz into the diffusion equation, I'll get a prediction for alpha, which is exactly the large deviations theory prediction. So that's a nice uh, property of the flow. So the more general theory we saw earlier from the generalized Yapunov exponents gave me this near the coil stretch. If I assume the flow is just this bacter kaikinen random flow, I'll get the same prediction, but this is valid for all Weisenberg. Okay, so if you want to relate the two things, it's because this particular flow, the kappa has a generalized Lyapunov uh, exponent spectrum that is quadratic for all, all Q. Anyway, but the point is I get this nice uh, analytical prediction uh, by replacing the turbulence with a, a random flow. So how does this do? I can now look at it actually do numerics, right? So that was with the Fokker Planck. I can put dumbbells in a bachelor Kraikinen flow and do the Brownian dynamic simulations. 
and uh, I mean, it should match, right? Uh, sorry, it should match the prediction, and that's what happens. So, as you cross Weisenberg 0.5, there is a coil stretch transition. And uh, Dario has done lots of work on this along with others. So, this is all with the bachelor Kraken flow. Okay, so that has that you saw this work was done in the early 2000s. Uh, a question that we wanted to look at from the perspective that I've been trying to build, right? That we want to go towards post grade models to model realistic polymers is whether we can use this turbulent flow as a useful surrogate to develop these kind of post grade models. So, suppose I have the dumbbell, I know it's qualitatively okay, but I want to, let's say, include this effect of the DNA being double or single strand or breakup or something like this. And I want to develop a new kind of effective model. But I don't want to do it in a simple extension flow because I know my turbulence is very different. So I should get, I mean, if you want even to do even, let's say, machine learning, you need data. So you need to put the different kinds of polymer models in turbulence. But turbulence is expensive. So instead of using turbulence, can I use this kind of bachelor Kraken flow is the question. So I want to quantitatively compare the behavior of a dumbbell in a random flow with actual turbulence. So that is the question here. Okay, so uh, before I do that, let me introduce another flow because why not, right? So I'm going to, in the previous random flow I showed you, it was delta correlated in time. The purpose there was for that case, I can write down the Fokker Planck equation instead. But if I want to move purely, I'm thinking in terms of computational uh, uh, intensity, then it's not very difficult if I'm anyway generating random numbers. I'll just generate random numbers which have some temporal correlation. So that will add some more, uh, an important property of turbulence because actual turbulence, of course, as a whole hierarchy of time scales, if you go small enough time scales, it's going to be correlated. Right? At the smallest length scales, it again becomes viscosity dominated. So then uh, one way to do this is uh, following this prescription uh, by, in this physics of fluids paper. So I write down the kappa tensor velocity gradient in terms of its symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. And the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, again, I mean, you just fill up the entries. These zetas and omegas are random numbers. And once again, I choose them to satisfy certain basic properties. So uh, the means have to be zero. The uh, I mean, and they are Gaussian distributed, right? So they have second order moments, which have this. This is a prescription given here, right? Which satisfies this important property of homogeneous isotropic turbulence. This is an exact thing you can derive from the Navier-Stokes. So this ensures that these basic properties are satisfied. Okay, so basically what this kind, this is a different sort of flow. It's still Gaussian. The previous flow was also Gaussian. Only difference is that I now have an exponential correlation. So the velocity gradient in this flow will not be delta correlated. It has some time persistence. So that now the polymer, if it is, happens to be aligned with the stretching, it will stay so for some time before the flow changes. <clears throat> okay, so now I can compare all three. Okay, so I'm going to show you simulations for dumbbells. Uh, the solid lines are uh, DNS results. So, I mean, full turbulence. The dashed lines are in that Gaussian correlated flow. And these are the PDFs for different Weisenberg. Okay. So, you see that they actually match remarkably well. I mean, they're not exact, but it's, I mean, quite good. And the differences seem to be less at higher Weisenberg, which is actually the case where interested in. That's where you'll get interesting effects. Uh, if I just look at the exponents, alpha, I plotted them here. So the solid markers are turbulence, the hollow symbols are this Gaussian correlated flow. And the curve is the analytical prediction for a delta correlated flow. Right? And again, you can see that there's quite good agreement between all of them. But uh, yes, so that's quite nice. But there is some slight deviation. So if you look at uh, uh, this portion here, around Weisenberg, around one, you'll see that the, and it's little surprising. So if you see at small Weisenberg, the real turbulence is actually stretching the polymers more. So remember the way alpha is defined, it's R to the minus one minus alpha. So if alpha is smaller, it means there's more stretching. So in this case, the turbulent polymers are more stretched in turbulence for small Weisenberg, but they're less stretched for high Weisenberg. There is some crossover between these solid guys and the Follow symbols. So it's a small effect, but there's actually an interesting physical reason. I'll just do it quickly. So it, uh, if you actually compare the statistics of the strain rate in my turbulent flow, which is the solid line and the Gaussian flow, you'll see that as expected, the turbulence is not Gaussian. So you can see that here, right? So the strain rates have a very wide tail in turbulence, but the Gaussian, I mean, it doesn't have these extreme events. 
but to compensate it has an abundance of moderate strain right so what this suggests is that possibly very elastic polymers uh, are stretching over a long history of strain rates so they actually benefit from having many moderate strain events that are persistent rather than once in a way encountering some huge uh, strain so we tested this i'll go through this a little quickly yeah. so these are individual trajectories of uh, the polymer stretch and this is where i put that threshold so i just you use an arbitrary threshold to say is it stretched or not and i can look at the time for which it stays in a stretched configuration and if i plot a distribution of those times uh, you actually get a nice exponential distribution which allows you to define a so it's a poisson distribution so it allows you to define a time scale for how long the polymer stays stretched that means in turbulence the polymer stretches out it stays stretched for some time and then again it collapses so what is the residence time that it spends in that stretched configuration so i can measure that and do it compare it uh, in the two flows so what you see is what we sort of expected that in the gaussian case there is a higher persistence time so what this tells you is that the way we constructed the gaussian flow is that it has fewer extreme events but the moderate straining is persistent for long time and in terms of physics what what that tells us is that if the polymer is elastic it's basically integrating over very long history of strain rates so then the it benefits from having mild but persistent strain in the flow so this is a kind of side point it just tells us that the nature of stretching is different at small and large weissenbach okay so maybe i'll uh, i would like to continue talking about this like an linear spring but i'll be fini and i'll stop at 4 so i'll talk this will be the last thing i'll talk about okay so uh, what i showed you so far for the pdf was all the stationary pdfs that means you put polymers into the flow you let the flow evolve and then once everything has reached uh, stationarity you sample and get the distribution of extensions but a relevant question for uh, applications is how is the transient right so if i have a tank of newtonian flow and i put in a blob of polymers or i, I just introduce polymer into the flow initially they all coiled and now the flow will start to stretch them out if you remember in those drag reduction measurements there's an initial transient when the drag reduction increases before it decreases so that transient is happening because polymers are taking some time to equilibrate and stretch out and what we wanted to ask is whether is whether we can understand that transient as well in terms of the pdf so one can do simulations of dumbbells in the same uh, this is now in the turbulent flow not in the random flow. so i do simulations of dumbbells in the turbulent flow and look at how the pdf changes in time and interestingly what we found is that at moderate weissenberg you actually develop a power law quite early you don't have to wait all that wait till it reaches stationary so you get some behavior like r to the power beta and then that power law increases in time till it reaches its final stationary value and if you fit power laws to this uh, transient pdf you'll see that that exponent beta actually relaxes exponentially to its final value so it's a relatively simple uh, relaxation i'll come back to this in a second if i do the same thing at very large weissenberg so now these polymers can be stretched quite rapidly so now they don't show this transient power law like that behavior is sort of different uh, but we'll uh, we'll not worry about this for now let's just look at this stretching where you do have this evolving power law and now of course there's always a worry that uh, is this just something i'm seeing right so if you i mean i think all of us have this problem of looking for power laws so if you start looking for them you will find them so this is uh, decent it's maybe one decade but you could always wonder is this just an artifact so now of course we have a route to test this with some theory so i go back to the bachelor kraken flow for which i have the oka planck equation this is just a normalized version of the same thing and i i can ask whether i see that same behavior here and in fact whether i can derive it so starting from there uh, i want to introduce this temporal uh, power law right so i begin with an ansatz of the following form so for very small extensions less than 1 you have this r square behavior that's just a consequence of uh, thermal fluctuations uh, at very large extensions the polymer has to the extension has to go down to match the fini criteria but for intermediate extensions between 
till some region close to the maximum, you can assume that it has a power law form r to the beta. So I can substitute this ansatz in here, and I'll get an equation for d beta dd, the evolution of that exponent. Uh, then what, what do I do with this c? The c is like a normalization thing, so I, it comes in this normalization condition, of which this third third integral is just the integration close to the Fini end. So that's contributes very little. We can get rid of it. And after some amount of algebra, if you assume that at large extensions log r and log r m, where r m is the max, that that they are almost equal, then you will actually get a power law. So you will see that yes, a power law is a real behavior at intermediate extensions for intermediate asymptotics, but with logarithmic correction. So there are slight deviations. And the evolution of that will follow this nice equation. Just to see the relaxation, I can linearize it about the long time exponent beta infinity, and then I'll really get an exponential relaxation. So the final prediction is that beta relaxes to its stationary value exponentially with a time scale t beta. That's exactly what we saw in the simulation. And what's interesting is the t beta, the time scale with which the PDF reaches its stationary value, that time scale actually diverges near the Weisenberg critical. So this is very interesting. This is what we've seen at right, critical transitions before. So this is nothing but the critical slowing down. And so when you approach this coil stretch, so so far I've introduced coil stretch heuristically. Right? It, I mean, I'm calling it coil stretch by identifying alpha equal to zero as coil stretch. But you can argue that maybe this is not real. It's not really a transition. But this is some evidence to support that it is it's meaningful to think of it that way. It, because when you are approaching this transition, when PDF goes from uh, less than minus one to greater than minus one, the dynamics actually slow down the way we know they do for other kinds of transitions. And this is this has been noticed before in terms of the full PDF with numerics, et cetera. But here we are just seeing it manifest in terms of this power law. Okay, so I'll, the final thing is that, yeah, so I have, uh, again, we'll test that out. So I, Bjorn can do simulations first of the Fokker Planck equation itself. So if I look at T beta, the solid circles are from simulations of the Fokker Planck equation. And that does kind of match well with this divergence near 0.5. Of course, it doesn't really go to infinity because that prediction was for infinite separation, it infinite uh, separation of scales. In these simulations, you have to put some finite uh, maximum extension. And now I can go back to the actual dumbbells in DNS and in the correlated Gaussian flow and measure that T beta. So this uh, line is the prediction if I put those dumbbells in a bachelor Kraken flow. The circles are if I put the dumbbells in a Gaussian correlated flow, so that accounts for the time correlation. And the solid symbols are in a real turbulence. Right, so you see that there is the qualitatively, of course, it's good. It, it's showing this kind of slowdown behavior in your point five. And most of the deviation from the DNS and that bachelor Kraken is accounted for by including just the temporal correlation of the random. Okay, so the main message here is uh, even the temporal transient statistics of polymer stretching one can capture if you use a random flow, provided you also build in some temporal correlation in the random. So delta correlated is nice to do the theory, but if you're anyway going to generate random numbers, it's not very difficult to do it with some temporal correlation. And that may be a better model for the flow. Okay, so I'll stop here, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so I think the main things I've uh, spoken about today is that elastic polymers, yeah. So one kind of take home message is that these elastic polymers are not so sensitive to extreme events in turbulence. So there are many uh, kind of Lagrangian properties of particles, for example, collisions between particles or the way uh, inextensible fibers break, et cetera, that are sensitive to having extreme events in turbulence. So in those kinds of things, if you try to replace turbulence with a random flow, your results are not very good. It's especially true for particle collisions, which uh, for example, Shamridi and Rama have been working on in the context of clouds and so on. So they're having extreme events and very strong vortices can give you very different behaviors, even in the statistics and things you're interested in. But for polymers, at least the ones which are very elastic, because their extension is really integral over the strain rates, the effect of those big spikes kind of get averaged up. So you do much better in predictions with random flows than you would in for other kinds of entities. So polymers is a good candidate to kind of replace 
uh, turbulence with randomness. And yeah, that's the second point. So the um, the idea in the future is to use these kinds of flows and now to start trying to develop polymer models that work well in turbulence, coarse grain. And yeah, a last interesting point is we saw that the power law in the PDF actually arises quite early. So if you're doing numerics or experiments and you see a power law, you should not think that you hit stationarity because that power law itself evolves, uh, albeit slowly. Great. So with that, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Thanks. So when you calculated that time scale divergence, you didn't put in the finite distance between particles in the calculation. How would you add that? How would you incorporate it? Uh, which distance? The... So you're saying that like in the infinite separation, yes. you would get a divergence. Ah, so right, what, right. How would you add the... Ah, yes, yes. So uh, the original Fokker Planck equation has the maximum extension in it. Uh, so there's a ratio of the maximum extension Where to the equilibrium. Ah, yes. Because it seems like the it diverged with an exponent minus one. Yeah, here. Yeah, so this is the original equation. Right, so you have terms like this and this stuff. So only when you make this, uh, right, it's only in this regime. So, uh, sorry, one. I don't have it here, but. Uh, Basically, this original diffusion equation as it stands here will not give you this kind of behavior. So there are some terms that drop out when you say that R is much greater than one, but much, much less than R max. So it's only when you make that assumption that you get this divergence. I mean, I was just wondering in the next formula that you had, where would R go in? Ah, so here it's actually gone. So at this point, uh, I made the assumption and then terms cancel out and give me an equation only for that exponent. I if I don't do this infinite extension, I won't even get the power law. I see. And did you do any finite size analysis to see how the time scale is growing with separation? Uh, sorry, any? Uh, did you do any like finite size study to see that? It's yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. So all we did, we did one thing. So, I mean, so yeah, so I saw the same diffusion equation. Uh, from one and let's say max extension was 500,000, 5,000. So that the data show a stronger peak. Is, is it there? No, I don't have it here. I okay. just, here I just show it for 1,000. Okay, yeah. thanks. Hello? Yeah, hi. Ah, yes. So, uh, like, uh, a kind of naive question, like, is there any intuitive argument about, like, why Gaussian works better than a decorator system like ah okay yeah like yeah yeah so the i mean one basic thing is that turbulence itself is not delta correlated in time yeah it, there will be some correlation correlation yeah and uh, sorry when i so that synthetic gaussian flow it has uh, the temporal correlation of the strain and the vorticity as input parameters so i have inputted them to match the dns that i have i see so compared to the delta correlated flow, this Gaussian correlated flow has this extra feature that it is correlated in a way like the turbulent flow is. So you would expect it to give a better match. Okay. So what we're looking at is how much the difference is compared yeah. to, so it looks like it accounts for quite a bit of the error. It's better. And uh, you are keeping, like how are you keeping homogeneity and isotropy of the system in um, uncorrelated? When you are going to uncover. Ah, so in both cases, the isotropy is uh, guaranteed by the way I choose the random numbers. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So okay. the yeah, that's all. Okay. I so the, the recipe that I showed you is that so you, you don't choose all nine random numbers. Oh. Or you choose them in such a way that they are second order uh, moments follow certain rules. So that's how I mean, you you built it in basically. So when I toss the random numbers and put it into that formula, I'll get a matrix which is statistically isotropic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
yeah so that i mean that's important we've not done that yet so that's like the next thing but uh, one one thing that i thought about in that connection is uh, so if you look that's why we wanted to see what is the effect of the extreme events so one effect the leading order effect is that the flow becomes more viscous in some sense so the kolmogorov time scale will drop but if i renormalize my weisenberg number and i can compare okay so i define a new weisenberg number which takes the modified kolmogorov time scale and then I can look at whether the PDFs will now overlap or whether there'll be some difference. So there are some uh, Brownian dynamics with coupling back, I think Bagheri at all. Uh, so they actually do this thing. Oh no, sorry, that is, yeah. That is, yeah, but yeah. I think Watanabe has. Uh, yeah, but yeah, more recently there is a, so they have done this renormalization and they find that the PDFs almost overlap, uh, but their Debra numbers are not so high, but at least with that, in the range they looked at, there is some overlap. And I think our results makes, I mean, make sense of it because what would happen is apart from the means changing, you would uh, cut off the extreme events. But what we are seeing is that for high Weisenberg passive polymers, the extreme events anyway don't matter so much. So maybe if you just renormalize the Weisenberg number, the behavior will stay the same. So that is one way, I guess, to I can do a Doe and Edwards like thing where you write up a series in terms of the gradients of velocity and then do a correction. I, I guess we could explore that. Thanks. Uh, so, so one important, uh, one interesting the thing that you showed that the uh, uh, distribution of this residence time, uh, the polymer are getting stretched. So, uh, so like uh, do do uh, this. Uh, you also showed that e to the power minus t by tau. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so I was wondering uh, if, if you increase your flow rate, so it's like do this time change or are they? inherent to the usual polymer relaxation time scale. So you're talking about this thing? Yes, yes. <clears throat> so, okay, so all of this is done relative to the Weisenberg number. So that has the flow time scale in it. So if I change the, let's say flow rate, in this case, I'm doing it in a box, but if I increase the mean velocity, that gets taken care of by the time scale of the flow to some extent, provided the Reynolds number is but if I also change the Reynolds number, then the structure of the flow itself changes. So for example, at moderate Reynolds number, I'll have uh, extreme events to some extent. At larger and larger Reynolds number, the extreme events will get stronger and stronger. So in that sense, one could argue that what I've shown here, that extreme events are not so important. Maybe that's just because my Reynolds number is finite. I mean, if you'd make it larger, maybe there would be an effect. But a counter to that is I'm comparing whatever extreme events are there, I'm comparing it to the Gaussian case. And that's quite a big difference. And yet the polymers don't seem to be affected. So the short answer is, I think if you change the mean flow, even if the Reynolds number changes, I think the Weisenberg will account for it, at least in this passive kind of limit. And on that note, uh, uh, is it possible to uh, have a calculation of local stress or local entropy, like again, in terms of the residence time? Yeah, yeah. so now that you have, uh, I mean, so I only showed PDFs of R, but you have all the data of all these guys. So you can calculate the uh, stress tensor and other properties for sure. Yeah. And last question is uh, at the beginning, you showed that. Uh, so when you put uh, polymer, uh, you, you see significant drag, drag reduction. Hmm. And, and uh, there was, uh, there was a one biopolymer at DNA right. that was being used. I was wondering what is the practical application of that? Of like, drag reduction. Yeah, yeah. so no, no, I mean, of the drag reduction, we know that right. if you put polymer in oil field industry, yeah, right. uh, uh, to transport things, uh, but uh, but what is the use of a biopolymer that has been used to reduce high drag? Ah, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what their motivation for them was, uh, but uh, from one point of view, the uh, DNA is a nice long chain polymer, so it could be they used it because it's some easily available, very long chain. Polymer. There could also be other applications where you want to deal with DNA in micro channels. Yeah, but I'm not sure. There might be better reasons. Thank you. From my perspective, it's interesting because they could split it open and see this big effect. Questions or if not, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>